So thank you for coming back uh, on time. Um, in 2008, uh, you, many of you may remember the CNN YouTube debates, um, which was uh, an attempt by the traditional mainstream media to sort of tap into some of the social media zeitgeist for the presidential election. And uh, we thought it was a nice first try, but we created something else uh, shortly thereafter in partnership with the New York Times um, that we called 10 Questions, where citizens would be able to post questions to the presidential candidates online, vote which ones they wanted them to answer, the top 10. Uh, that was over a six week period. And then after uh, that was completed, the 10 questions were submitted to the candidates and they would have four weeks to respond. But the best part of that was is that after the candidates responded, we all got to vote on whether they actually answered the question. Um, we were fortunate uh, to ha have uh, six candidates, including Barack Obama, respond to the questions. And uh, we thought it was a successful first try and uh, in, in really building a new type of online debate platform for candidates for public office. Um, so uh, with the coming midterm elections, we're very happy today to announce that in a partnership with the Knight Foundation and support from the Knight Foundation and uh, working with Google and YouTube, we are going to relaunch uh, 10 questions for the midterm elections. Um, and we're going to start working in about 10 states um, and try to find the races that are most competitive. Um, and it's going to work pretty much the same way. Uh, people will be able to submit questions to the specific candidates in their districts, or whether the Congressional, Senate, or um, Governor, uh, over, uh, depending upon the state, four to six weeks, and then the candidates will be asked to respond. We're looking for media partners in, in, uh, in, in various districts, and we so far have got the San Francisco Chronicle, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the Akron Beacon Journal as partners. In local markets, we've been talking to some of the large um, media companies like uh, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and uh, CNN and others to, to, to also join this conversation and to get the word out. But for those of you who are interested in working with us on this project, uh, Daniel Tuellis from our staff is right here on the right who uh, is here all day. If you have anything you're interested in talking to him about that, please seek him out or find one of our staffers. We would love to work with you in this project. Our overall goal is that what, by the time we get to the 2012 presidential campaign, we can give the Presidential Debate Commission a run for its money and actually give a conversation to the American public that's worth having, not just on television. Thank you very much. Uh, to sit down on stage, um, I'm going to sort of do introductions at the same time. So um, as I said before, we're going to be uh, having now a series of talks about how being hyper-networked and hyper-connected um, can change how we live, how we govern ourselves, uh, how our media works. Um, and it's, I think, not news to this community how much the open data movement uh, that I think in many ways started, ironically enough, in Washington, D.C., but not the federal part of Washington, D.C., the city of Washington, D.C., showing us uh, first under the leadership of Vivek Kundra and now under the leadership of Brian Sivak, uh, uh, the new CTO there, uh, just how powerfully uh, freeing public data and building apps on top of it um, can begin to change how we who live in cities function. Uh, so I'm very excited today uh, to bring Brian together uh, with Jen Palka of Code for America over uh, on the other side, um, uh, who is leading a movement of developers uh, who are going to volunteer time the same way Teach for America uh, works to uh, young people volunteering their time uh, to help in the education system. Uh, they've got a couple of very exciting announcements to make, and they're joined by Stacy Donahue of the Omidyar Network, and in a second you'll see why she's here. So take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Mika. Uh, and thank you, Mika and Andrew, for letting us talk a little bit about Code for America. Um, Mika described it briefly, but since we are a very new organization, I thought I'd give you the broad overview before we um, uh, have Stacy and Brian talk a little bit about their announcements and their news today. Um, but Code for America was really born out of two observations. Um, one, of course, is that government needs to change, but more specifically that cities, other than DC, <laughs> are in a major crisis. Something like 90% of them 
are responding to budget crisis by cutting services, and this is not what we want them to do. Uh, and yet there are in so many cities these huge inefficiencies, once you get in there and really look, um, that can be exploited. Because what's happened in the private sector uh, and what's starting to happen in the, in the activism world that you see here, where the boundaries of the organization are being blurred and you're bringing in uh, <coughs> constituents to be part of the solution to the problem, is only just now starting to happen in government. Um, so we saw uh, a Neil Dash talk about this yesterday with um, with his project and uh, Anish Chopra talked about a number of great things that are happening in open data and bringing in uh, a huge ecosystem to help solve these problems. But this needs to be happening in many, many places across the country and cities are a great place to start with this. Um, there's also a huge talent crisis in cities right now. Uh, something like 60% of municipal employees will be retiring in many cities in the next five years. If we replace those people with nine to fivers, cities don't really stand a chance. We've got to solve the talent crisis in cities right now. So the first observation is that cities are in crisis and need to change. And the second one really is that there's this huge community of talented technologists and designers that want to help. I'm talking about the kinds of people that are here today in this room um, who've had careers and realized that this is the kind of problem that they can help solve but also the millennial generation, which has been profiled as being one of the most do-gooder and socially service-oriented generations in, in a very long time. So what we did is we saw these twin problems and said, what's the model that we can use to, uh, to, to, we can apply to this? And we asked the question, what if there were a Teach for America for the web industry? So that's how Code for America was born. Uh, it's a very new organization. Uh, where we are, uh, we started sort of late last year. Um, we put out a call to cities and uh, had many apply. We've chosen five cities who've come to the table with very innovative uh, technology projects that we think will really help make cities a better place to live, engage citizens, and make them more efficient and effective. Uh, those cities are Washington, D.C., and Brian's going to talk in a few minutes about the project we're doing with D.C., which doesn't fit the mold but really has the potential to uh, have the greatest impact of any of our, of our projects. Um, also Seattle, Philadelphia, Boulder, Colorado, and Boston. Um, so we have our cities chosen and great projects, and on Tuesday we launched our call for fellows. So we'll recruit five fellows per city um, to come in and build these projects over the course of a very structured year um, where the teams will work both collaboratively and competitively um, but they'll, they'll be on site in the Bay Area and we will bring in the top names from both government and Silicon Valley to support these fellows, connect them, and really give them uh, a launching pad for either a career in public service or to maybe do a startup in this space and build this ecosystem that needs to happen to, to, um, uh, to support this, this uh, open city idea. So that's where we are. Um, I will ask at the end for your help in getting the word out about our fellows program. Um, but what I'd like to do right now is, um, is to have Stacy make a little announcement. We uh, really exist because um, people believe in our vision. And Stacy Donahue with the Omidyar Network is one of those people. Hi, I'm Stacy Donahue with Omidyar Network. Uh, I lead our government transparency investment area at ON. And I'm delighted to announce today that Omidyar Network is making a $250,000 grant to Code for America to help jumpstart. <laughs> <laughs> to help jumpstart uh, the program and uh, help Jen hire a staff of people to recruit the first set of fellows, uh, as well as work with the cities on the programs for next year. Uh, and um, you know, the reason that we are so excited about Code for America is uh, the way it really enhances transparency, accountability, and citizen engagement with local government. So we cannot wait to work together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stacey, both for the announcement and for the grant, <laughs> uh, which is the start of, of um, a larger fundraising effort for us, but it, it, really the key piece that we needed, and it's wonderful. Um, I wanted to uh, pass it off to Brian. We, uh, the other four cities that we've recruited are doing really technology <coughs> projects. So they're looking at ways that you, they can engage citizens to help solve the problems of the city. Um, and those fellows will be primarily designers, developers, product managers, data wranglers. We're doing, working really with an open data mandate here in all of the cities. Um, 
But when we met with Brian about what the projects would, could be, the DC could sponsor, we found that there were a huge number of innovative projects already going on in DC. And so um, Brian's going to talk about what we decided to do with DC that will, I think, have probably a bigger impact than any of the other individual technology projects um, that, we, that we sponsor this cycle. So thanks, Jen. Um, first of all, for any of you who know uh, Jen and the work that she's been doing, uh, I'm just blown away by how hard uh, she's working at this and how much effort uh, it takes to get this done. So just a round of applause for Jen, please. I, I'm glad um, <clears throat> so, you know, the, the concept for the project that we're working on really started through a series of conversations that um, I've had with any number of big city CIOs across the country. Actually, myself and six other uh, CIOs talk on a regular basis every couple of weeks to discuss the projects we're working on and things that we can collaborate on. But it also extends to state CIOs and CTOs as well as um, CIOs and CTOs on the federal level, including Anish Chopra and Vivek Kundra. And the interesting thing to me is that it turns out that pretty much everybody is working on exactly the same projects. They have exactly the same problems, uh, the same issues, the same concerns. And there's a lot of duplication of effort going on. Um, many of these things are um, visualized in terms of uh, people actually buying software products and implementing, implementing them. But also, there's a lot of custom development, open source usage, and things like that. Now, as Jen said, um, the, the project that we're doing is a little different from other uh, CFA projects. The idea is that it's really, it's sort of a meta project. We're going to be creating a non-jurisdictional organization, something, um, and that's important because it has to live on past me, past the current administration in DC. Uh, it can't be necessarily tied to DC. It has to be for everybody. But the idea of this organization is that it's going to provide a, um, essentially a framework to be able to uh, open source and collaborate on any amount of technology uh, and any type of technology that, that uh, cities or other jurisdictions are working on currently. Um, <clears throat> we're still in a, I would say, sort of a definition phase of this. And so, you know, we're, it's sort of iterating over time. And, and every conversation I have with, with people, uh, it changes slightly. But right now, I'm kind of thinking of this in terms of three different phases. Uh, the first phase is really building the foundation of the organization. So, build the technology backbone, the charter of the organization itself, the legal framework, the marketing framework, uh, the way that people can help to participate in it, et cetera. Um, and then once that's in place, or at least the, the framework of that is in place, we want to seed it with certain projects. So we have, as Jen was saying, a number of different um, uh, initiatives that we've worked on over time. Uh, our data catalog, which we've been building since 2005. Uh, our master address repository, which is essentially a set of web services that can disambiguate any input uh, address to a, a physical location, uh, and any number of other things. So we'll seed it sort of with these software projects that we can then generalize and open source. And then um, also build on the concept of the Open 311 API that we've developed with San Francisco, and really build a true open city API. The idea there being that you can really define any uh, interaction with a jurisdiction uh, through this programming interface so that people can write applications and interface with a city in a programmatic way. Um, so that's sort of the first two things. And then the, the third thing, um, uh, and, and this sort of came out of actually a conversation that we were having yesterday uh, with, with Jen and, and um, uh, some of the guys from Open Plans and Tim O'Reilly. Um, the, the idea is really, I think, at the end of the day to build a, a civic stack of software that any jurisdiction can then go to and say, you know, I want a data catalog. I'll have one of those. Um, or maybe it's a jurisdiction anywhere around the world that uh, has nothing, no technology whatsoever. They can just take the entire stack. And the key thing there is interoperability, right? All of these different packages need to be able to talk to each other with defined inputs and outputs so that we can actually literally just take a piece of code and drop it in place, a little bit of configuration, and have it work. Um, so that's um, you know, sort of, the, the, I think, the long-term vision. Um, we're really looking forward to getting started on this. We're actually going to get started uh, sooner than most of the Code for America projects because I think this is going to be a good foundation and infrastructure to put the rest of them into. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time, I think, in this session for questions, but um, Jen and I are going to be um, on a panel later on today uh, talking about a lot of this stuff, so feel free to come and ask any questions you might have then. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get one more second here? Yeah, I'll go. Uh, so to add on a little bit to what Brian said, um, we do build the uh, applications for each individual city, but then they're open source made available to any other city who wants to use them, and that's part of why we have this project. 
I just want to say also, Clay Johnson, I think, asked you all to think about your lists yesterday and getting beyond your lists. We don't have been a lot of a list, and if anybody in the audience wants to help us get the word out about our fellows program, please come talk to me or Stacy or Brian or Tim O'Reilly or Clay Johnson. Andrew Boucher is also on our board. So anyway, thank you very much. We could use your help. Absolutely.